This is about EME or moon bounce. And if you're not familiar with moon bounce or that term, it's where we take uh, amateurs take their radios and bounce signals off the moon. We use it as a passive reflector. And what it allows us to do is at frequencies we normally can't get wide coverage on, like let's say uh, VHF, UHF, and microwave, with a passive reflector on the moon, we can pretty much hit every point on the face of the earth at some time or another. So moon bounce is pretty cool. Now for, for a long, long time, it was a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, I will tell you that I've, I've accomplished moon bounce on two meters, the old fashioned way on CW, being able to hear my own echoes, echoes and work quite a few stations, but it took a lot to do that. It's, it's no mean feat. Uh, today, it's pretty easy to do if you use the digital modes, but this is a few years ago, so we weren't using digital modes for this project. But anyway, I'm a little bit about me. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Dennis W60Q. I was first licensed in 1969, novice WN6NIA, and you'll hear that my call sign when I upgraded, I became an advanced the following year, early 1970, I got my advanced class, and so you'll hear that call sign in one of the uh, uh, audio clips on here. And... Uh, but anyway, I just re I retired about 10 years ago after um, uh, 45 years as a system engineer after I left, uh, left college, working in aerospace at the end, but uh, did a whole lot of different stuff. Uh, some of you know what the things I've done, but worked as a, <clears throat> well, I got my, my BSW in 1974. And uh, I worked on everything from large scale sound systems like theater sound systems uh, and not only building them, but operating them and touring with them. So I was doing concert sound, built large computer systems and I worked in the telecom and network engineering field. And I retired doing uh, information assurance and cryptographic systems. So that's, that was my career. But I've been a ham for over 50 years. And it was, as of this year, it's uh, 53 years as a ham. And personally, I'm a builder, a maker, an experimenter. I'm a published author. Some of you know that, that I published a book on, uh, on Arduino projects with a co-author, Jack Purdom. Uh, but I'm also the uh, emergency coordinator for our ARIES group here in Eastern Kern County, California. So that's a little about me. Now a little about the project. So we'll start it with this. Who doesn't want to be a big gun station? You know, you got all that aluminum in the air, you really want to have a big signal, right? And it, it's not just HF. How about microwaves? There's a, there's a guy in every crowd you know, with a big dish. While the rest of us are using one foot, two foot, three foot dishes, old Robin's got his six foot dish out there for the microwave contest. So, but, you know, a, more, more aluminum in the air, what do we call that? An aluminum overcast, right? So uh, big gun stations. So there's a lot of big gun stations in the world. I'm, I certainly don't consider myself a big gun here. I'm, I'm on my way, but not quite yet. But what if we actually got the opportunity to be a big gun, but on something a little different, a big gun on EME? And so we're gonna talk about what we did. Uh, this is the, uh, the San Bernardino Microwave Society. Uh, and I will add that I, I was uh, past, I have been the past president of the San Bernardino Microwave Society. I've been a member of the society since about 1999 when I first joined. And we did just that. We became a big gun on Moon Bounce. And it started in February of 2004. We were invited to attend the, uh, for the first annual West Coast Conference of the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, SARA. And they were being sponsored by California Institute of Technology, Caltech, at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And the Owens Valley Radio Observatory is about, what, 100 miles north of where we live here, up in the Owens Valley, here in, in the eastern side of uh, the Sierras in, in California. So we're up there doing, uh, doing this conference. We, we actually, a couple, there were three of us that went to the conference from SBMS, and two of us actually presented papers at the uh, conference, which was kind of fun. Um, but while we were there, we got to tour their facilities. And while we're touring the facility, we're, uh, <laughs> this, is the, this is the 40 meter dish at Owens Valley Radio Observatory, 130 feet in diameter. That is a big dish. So this all starts when we're 60 feet up in the air during our tour and we're right there on that catwalk 
talking with a fellow by the name of James Fredsty. James Fredsty was one of the engineers at OVRO. Unfortunately, he was laid off shortly thereafter, but, but he's the one that got us started. We were talking about this antenna, and the antenna had not been used for science since 1984. It had basically been mothballed, and the only thing they'd been using it for was educational outreach program that they ran out of the observatory. So they're looking for proposals of things to do with this antenna. So the three of us, Doug Millar, myself, and uh, Chuck Swedloom, WA6EXV, we're all looking at each other and we're, we're hands in the air exclaiming, moon mounts. And James tells us, well, what you need to do, this is a great idea. What you need to do is write a proposal, send it to the director of the observatory and see what you get back. See if they'll accept it. So let me tell you a little bit about the uh, observatory right now. Uh, the observatory I mentioned before is uh, owned and operated by uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech. The observatory began operation in 1963 and it actually began operation on the high, high HF bands up around 30 megs was the first telescope they had up there it was an HF telescope of all things. This is one of, if not the largest university owned radio observatory in the world. It is a huge facility. And it's located about 275 miles north of LA near the town of Bishop. And I mentioned that's about hundred miles. It's about hundred mile drive from here up to OVRO. So their science that they do there, and, and you can check them out. If you'd like to go see their website, uh, they've got a wonderful website that talks about the experiments that are currently going on there. And it's ovro.caltech.edu. So if you, if you just Google uh, Owens Valley Radio Observatory, you'll find that. But, but the, their homepage gives you a rundown of all the programs that are going on there right now, which is really, really cool. They got a lot of stuff happening. But they do science all the way from the, uh, the, the high end of HF, like around 30 megahertz, all the way up to uh, the sub terahertz range. So in the high uh, sub millimeter wave uh, wavelengths, they've got uh, telescopes operating up there. So it's a pretty, pretty wide spectrum that they cover. But we're going to specifically talk about the 40 meter antenna. It was built and commissioned in 1967 by, West, by Westinghouse, of all things. And their principal uh, investigation, the principal research they did from that time uh, until 1964, and I should say until 1984, I apologize, that's a typo. I updated that today and messed that up. Uh, from 1967 until 1984, they were involved in the cosmic background radiation measurement experiment, which is still ongoing today in other observatories. This is a, this is a, one of the grand experiments in, uh, in radio astronomy is the uh, cosmic background radiation. And we keep refining that every year. It gets refined a little bit better by different observatories. So this has been their principal investigation uh, was cosmic background radiation. But in 1984, the systems there were becoming obsolete. They decided to shut the telescope down for research and it was used strictly for educational outreach. So they do tours, bring school kids up and it's all, you know, STEM is a big deal. So they bring a lot of kids and, and uh, folks up to the observatory. You, in those days, you could go to the Chamber of Commerce in Bishop and arrange a tour of the observatory, which I think you can still do that even in, well, you may not be able to do that right now because of COVID, but I, I know once COVID is, is, is through, we're done with that, uh, you can probably contact the, uh, the um, uh, Chamber of Commerce in, in uh, Bishop and they will set up a tour of the observatory. And it's a pretty, pretty fascinating place to visit. So <clears throat> if you know anything about optical systems, when we talk about focal ratios and things like that, so this, is a, this dish has a focal length of 52 feet, 130 foot diameter with a focal length of 52 feet. So the, uh, the F to D ratio is 0.4. So this is a very, very high gain dish. And just to, to give you an example, at 1,296 megahertz, we're looking at 54 dB of gain, 54 dB. Now, remember, when you're doing moon bounce, you not only get gain on the transmit side, you get gain on the receive side. So we're looking in excess of 100 dB of gain just from the antenna. And if you know anything about, uh, if you know a little about EME, the path loss, the path loss is typically in the range of about 250 dB. 
So it's a pretty lossy path. And part of that is because of the surface of the moon. It's the, uh, the rough surface of the moon, the fact that it's spherical, uh, the spher spherical rough surface, the fact that it's moving tends to disperse the energy uh, and uh, scatter it. So uh, that, that path loss is pretty, pretty major, 250 dB. But at 10 gigahertz, the gain is 71 dB. So 100, that's a huge percentage of the path loss on 10 gigahertz. The antenna I mentioned earlier is usable up to 24 gigahertz, the KA band, and it is currently being used up in that frequency range right now. So, so we formulate a plan. We're going to write a proposal. And uh, the proposal is, oh, come on, what's going on? There we go. From the San Bernardino Microwave Society, we're going to, um, we're going to send a proposal to Caltech and specifically to the director of OVRO. So we write this, we write this proposal that talks about EME, amateur radio, earth, moon, earth communications. And one of the interesting things is not many radio telescopes transmit. <laughs> That's not a regular thing for telescopes to do. They like to receive, but they don't transmit. Uh, so it's kind of an unusual thing, first of all, for, uh, for OVRO to do that. The other thing we thought about was this program that we're going to embark on would dovetail into their educational outreach program. And we had the concept of doing something similar to ERIS, right, where we could use the moon as a passive reflector to be able to talk to kids here, be able to talk to kids in other parts of the world via the moon, which would be kind of exciting. You know, if you get down to it, that's a pretty cool thing. So we're talking about the uh, remote education and getting kids interested in, you know, the STEM out, the STEM aspect of this. So getting that educational outreach program back on track. Well, it turns out the observatory wasn't really interested in that. They didn't really care that much about the outreach. They kind of played that out. So what they were really interested in was the amateur radio aspect of it, because as amateurs, we could produce a huge audience for the observatory. You know, we, we would publish, we published a lot of information, uh, published a lot of articles about it uh, throughout the world. Uh, we've had two articles written in the uh, CQ magazine in Japan. One was a cover story. Uh, so th that's the sort of thing they were really interested in. So to that end, we sent the proposal in and in a matter of days, we get a phone call. When can you start? And the director says, can you come up this weekend? <laughs> so it's like, they want us to do this right now. Well, there's a lot of stuff we've got to go through. So we, we met with the observatory with Tony Beasley, director. Um, we met with him and we arranged, we basically set out a schedule. We said, our goal is to, to be on the air by the 2005 ARRL International EME Contest. So that gives us about a year or so to get things in order. So there's a lot of things that have to be done. So we started our plan, started doing our planning. As any engineering project, you've got to go through, you've got to create schedules, you're going to create budgets, you're going to create uh, 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 preliminary designs, detailed designs. We went through all of this. We actually had design reviews and we did the whole, the whole wazoo. But starting with our higher level designs, we wanted to do some trade-offs to figure out what exactly we were going to do with this telescope. So one of the things we got to figure out is what bands are we going to operate on? Well, there's a lot of bands that this thing would operate on. And I'll tell you, today, I would love to be able to run this thing on two meters because it would work quite well on two meters. But since we were the microwave society uh, and we're... Um, our, our charter is to explore and, and work with frequencies above 1,000 megahertz. That sort of kills one, two meters and 70 centimeters. And we settled, basically settled on, uh, on 1296 and 10, 10 gigahertz, 10368. Uh, that narrowed the field down. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Well, one of the interesting things that happened when we were at the Sarah conference uh, our hosts there said, you guys are hams. You guys like surplus electronics, don't you? Oh yeah, we like surplus. <laughs> surplus is fun. So the observatory said, well, we've got all these surplus receivers that we don't need anymore. Um, would you guys like to have them? We're going, oh, receivers, cool. You know, there's probably all kinds of microwave stuff and all this neat thing. Well, the receiver is this 
canister, and that's a picture of the receiver, that is bolted into, it bolts into the 40 meter dish. We got about half a dozen of these things that they sent us home with. <laughs> the cool thing is it bolts right into the 40 meter dish. That's what they're from. And since they aren't using them anymore, they said, you guys want them. You know, you're into microwaves. You guys might like this stuff. Well, what we really liked was the canister because it bolts right in. It uses all the existing cable that's there. And we just built our transverters into it. So our final design consisted of two independent transverters, one for 1296 and one for 10 gigs. And they were built into this canister and housed at the focus of the antenna with a single 144 megahertz IF coming down from the top, down from the, uh, from the package. So uh, this was pretty cool. Uh, it, was a, it was a real benefit that they gave these things to us and uh, we got to use them for that. Pretty, pretty neat stuff. So the next step was we had to go up to the observatory and do some site surveys. We really needed to know what was going on there. This thing hadn't been used since 1984. So who knows what's going on up there? Uh, there was a lot of uh, unsavory things in the uh, inside the uh, the uh, pedestal, uh, bird droppings and things like that, and who knows what they got into. But the goal of our site surveys were to go up and document all the interfaces in the antenna. And so we start up at the focus, which is out there in midair, and we've got to we've got to document all the interfaces for the transverter package, for the IF interfaces and for the control interfaces and power. We've got to have power out there for this. Well, it turns out they've got 115 volts AC up at the focus. Well, that's that's a one solved problem. We got to make sure it's working and it's still intact. But there's massive amounts of cables coming down from the focus down to the uh, to the hub and the, uh, and the pedestal there. So the next thing we've got to look at, so we go up and we chart out the, we chart out the focus. The next thing is the Allidade. And that, that's probably a new term to many people. The allodade is the part of the antenna that moves. It's the part that rotates in azimuth as well as moving in elevation. So that's the allodade, and that's right there. You can see the some of the big gears that are used to move the antenna. And again, this is where the IF is. There's there's a patch panel up there for IF for our IF cables for the control cables, and for power. And we have to make sure that all those patch cables, all the the cabling is intact from the Allidade to the focus, and then from the Allidade down to the control room, which is down in the pedestal, all those cables intact, all the connectors are all good, and that everything is in place and all the patch cables are there so we can connect everything together. So in the control room, we're again, looking at that IF interface and the control interfaces to the transverter. So one of our guys went through and did a detailed document basically took the document that they had originally and updated it and and we checked all the cables out basically buzzed everything out made sure things were working and checked it and gave them a copy of what we found so we basically updated their their uh, uh, survey document of the antenna which is pretty neat so our design i'll start showing you some of the uh some of the pieces that we designed this actually went into that receiver case you saw this is the 1296 transverter. And this guy consists of, um, oh, where's my laser pointer? There it is. This is, uh, this is an actual the 100 watt uh, power amplifier for 1296. There's, uh, this is, I think the receiver strip. This is a local oscillator down here. This is producing the uh, local oscillator for the receiver and the receiver and all is located on this board here or this chassis. Uh, the transmitter, there's a, there's a, basically a transmitter board also similar to this that's driving this transverter to 100 watts output. So that's 12, That's what we're doing on 1296. On 10 gigahertz, we're running 30 watts. We've got a, a traveling wave tube amplifier, a TWTA, and that's this big box right here. And I'll have more stories about that shortly. Uh, again, it's a bread, basically we do, this is the way we build stuff for microwave. It's all bread, it looks like a breadboard. So there's a preamp that's a low noise amplifier there for 10 gigahertz. There's mixers and gain blocks and a local oscillator and things like that all, all here on this chassis. And the 30 watt TWT going out. And of course there's changeover relays for transmit to receive. Uh, so those are the transverters. And for the feeds, let's see, I've got a, 
got a picture of the feed. There's a, we use a, a what's called a chaparral feed on 10 gigahertz. And on 1296, we use what's called a patch feed. And there's a little load resistor here because patch feed is actually a two port device. Now, one of the things you notice right away is that those two feeds are offset. When it's installed on the antenna, they're offset vertically. So the, the dish does not focus in the same, well, it, the antennas are not at the focus for the two bands, right? Because the main focus, if we're at the focus of the dish is gonna be right here. Turns out it's a spherical dish. And if we just offset the dish a little tiny bit, the focus moves and it moves from here to here. And that's all programmed into the antenna controller for the dish. We just set what that distance is and it moves it for us because this is a common problem that they would deal with doing radio astronomy. They might have multiple receivers in a package with different feeds and they're in different locations on the package. So they have to be able to move the dish in a different direction to be able to accommodate that. The other thing that was fascinating about this dish, this thing weighs 500,000 pounds. And you can imagine when it moves from horizontal to vertical, gravity has an effect on it and it actually distorts the uh, structure. So the positioning system actually compensates for the effects of gravity on the antenna. So you can calculate accurately where an object is that you're gonna look at in the sky. In this case, we're gonna look at the moon and we can track the moon, but to get the antenna to point at the moon, we have to compensate for that gravitational effect of, uh, of the mass of the antenna and the fact that it's being distorted. So that was one of the fascinating things about, uh, about running, this, running this thing up there, just the sheer scale of it. So how do we get up to the focus? Well, you, there's a ladder and there's a hatch. So we put the dish down in what's called maintenance position where the, the dish is actually pointed at the horizon or close to it. We open this little hatch up. There's a little catwalk inside that goes out to that hatch. Open the hatch up. You kind of jump over from this little ledge here over to this uh, ladder, which is going up at 45 degrees, and you follow this ladder up. And where does it take you? That's the view up to the focus. And uh, that's our WA6EXV going up to the uh, going up to the focus. Believe it or not, Chuck, when we were doing this, he's in his he was in his 80s when we were working on this, and he went up there like a teenager. He loved climbing. <laughs> he was he just had a blast up there. But that's the uh, that's the track up to the uh, up to the um, up to the focus of the antenna where the, all the equipment is. Well, of course, not to be left behind. Yours truly, W60Q, uh, decides to make a trip up there, and uh, I did. <laughs> I mean, try, I'm I'm heading up there, uh, and it was quite interesting. Uh, I, I'm somewhat acrophobic, but I didn't have a problem with this, so it's it was fascinating to me that it didn't bother me. So. At the focus, how do we get the uh, how do we get the package up there? Well, these are some I I images of uh, the uh, package being lifted into place. You can see the uh, transverter package here. There's a little jib crane up here with an electric winch on it, and you basically go down on the ground. You hook it up to the package and you hoist the thing up in the air. Uh, this is our uh, uh, our advisor and and consultant at the observatory, Mark Hodges. He's uh, strapped in and he's uh, swinging the receiver package over to bolt it into this receptacle right there. That's what it bolts into, and this is it right here. And it's bolted in place, and Chuck's hooking up the cables that we have. And you can see all this, uh, all this gears and chains here, that's the focusing, and, and that's for focusing and collimating the, uh, the feed. That's what that does. So more on that in a little bit. That's what it looks like when it's in place. And that's approximately uh, 80 feet in the air, give, give or take a few feet. It's about 80 feet up uh, at the focus. So quite a quite a quite a sight. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, we're going to if you're if you're into astronomy, you know about the phrase first light. We're going to turn everything on and start listening to something. Well, what we're going to listen to is the sun because the sun generates all kinds of noise. And before he asks the question, the paint that's on the surface of the dish is a special paint that's non-reflective of infrared. So we don't heat our equipment up with the reflection of the sun. 
which is, uh, which is a good thing, even that's focused down there. It's a non-reflective surface, that white paint that you see. So we're not damaging our equipment up there at the focus by pointing the thing at the sun. But this is a common way that they focus the antenna and collimate it is by focusing on sun noise. And that's exactly what we're doing there. And this is Mark at the uh, antenna control system uh, controlling that focus and the collimation controls that I told you about, those motors and the chains and gears and all that, the sprockets. That is how you collimate the antenna. So that's making sure that the focus is right on where it's supposed to be. So that's our first light. So now we're going to get on the air as, as the San Bernardino Microwave Society, W6IFE. So we're thinking, oh yeah, this is going to be a cakewalk, right? <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> Nothing is ever as easy as it seems. Well, we figured we'd do. I had a nice little 1296 handy talkie. And we can do FM with our, uh, with our IF radio. So we figure, oh yeah, well we'll just uh, we'll just do a two way uh, two way contact between the the uh, our system here and the handheld, and you know we just set up on the same frequency, and everything will be just hunky dory. Well, Murphy's always lurking. <laughs> We've got our tests set up, all set up, but nothing's working. We can't hear the HT on this system, and of course the HT can't hear the transverter. So we're putting out RF. We can see that we got RF going out. Things are working. But the question is, what frequency are we on? Well, we figured out that we weren't on the right frequency. That was the problem. But why aren't we on the right frequency? Well, we've got a local oscillator up in the focus that is phase locked to a reference oscillator at 10 megahertz that's controlled by a rubidium standard down in the control room. And guess what? the cable wasn't plugged in. <laughs> so we plugged in the cable and we had success. We were able to have a first two-way conversation from the HT to the antenna, the, the EME system. So we're on the air. So all we have to do is wait for the moon to come up over the mountains, wait for moonrise, and we're on the air for the contest SW6IFE. So just waiting. So what's the first thing you do when you're testing your system and you're waiting? Let's see, I think I've got share sound on. You guys will have to let me know if you can hear this, but here we go. Big, big thing. Okay, so you're hearing our, our first echoes off the moon and you notice there's about a two and a half second delay. That's the time it takes for the signal to propagate out to the moon and come back. 186,000 miles. And you'll also notice that the first, the first tiny bit of the, uh, of the signal is cut off. And that's because I was using uh, uh, Vox on the system. That was probably kind of a mistake to do that. The, uh, we use a sequencer, you know, you have to sequence everything out. So I'm transmitting before everything is all settled down. So I'm losing that first, uh, that first dit when I'm transmitting. But uh, there we go. We got our, we know everything's working now. We're getting, we're getting echoes off the moon. And at 1296, you've got Doppler shift. Remember the moon is moving with respect to where we are on the earth. And so we get a massive Doppler shift at that frequency. It's like 50 kilohertz. So we're, you're really, uh, we're really, you know, we had to calculate out that Doppler shift, set our transmit frequency, and then receive, go to the receive frequency to get our echoes back. And I'm not sure, I, I don't see it on there. We should have been running in split mode. Um, but what you see here, this is the, uh, we're using an IC, uh, ICOM IC746 Pro as our IF radio, and using a, uh, a rig blaster as the interface for controlling everything. And this is actually the sequencer over here that, that turns on things like the preamp and the power amplifier, turns them on and off, flips the antenna changeover relays and, and puts the uh, transmitter into transmit mode. So we were still cutting off that first bit of the signal. But anyway, well, if you've ever done EME, and this is, this is something that, you know, when I built my EMA station, the first thing I had to do when I built my own station was this. Bounce your call sign off the boon. 
and I was I was the first I got the job of being the first to do that and with our setup there and uh, that was a lot of fun and we all took turns doing that everybody got to send their call sign and bounce it off the moon so that was pretty cool that was pretty cool so we're set up and ready to go for the 2005 AWRL international EME contest wow 10 30 p.m saturday night is the start time when the moon comes up over the mountain and uh it, it's the white mountains to the east of the observatory there that's what the, the moon's cleared the white mountains and i kid you not it sounded like 20 meters in a dx contest it was just a roar from one end of the band to the other it was just massive and the signals were loud well, our first contact was with G3 LTF on CW. We made about 10 contacts. We completed 10 contacts on CW. And one of the guys we talked to, HB9BBD, asked us if we have CSSB capability. And we're all looking at each other going, heck yeah, we can do SSB. So we made a few more contacts on SSB. Uh, but then we ended up with a pileup. And, and on EME, a pileup on EME is nothing like a pileup on HF. I mean, you can't make heads or tails out of anything. The signals are spread out about 50 kilohertz wide because of all the Doppler shift, and they're all on single sideband, and you can't make heads or tails out of every, anything. So we made a couple of contacts on sideband, and we said, not, this is not going to work. We told everybody we're going back to CW. So uh, we went back over to CR, uh, back, back to CW. So to give you an idea, there you go. <laughs> what was the last time you ever had to do that on EME? Well, one of the fun things is one of the stations we talked to, uh, OK1DFC, sent me some sound bites. And so we're going to share what our signal sounds like in Europe. Come on, you can do it. Do I have to click it? You may have to. There it is. That's, that is OK1DFC OK recording our signal from W6IFE. You can hear the Doppler shift changing because the moon's moving, right? The Doppler shift is constantly changing. That's pretty amazing to me. I, I just, I'm just blown away by that. But the thing that really blew me away was the next one. an edit in there but if you listen carefully to that that recording at the beginning of the recording you hear ok1 dfc saying over over and if you count it out it's about five seconds right well actually it should be about two and a half seconds i, I said five seconds that's wrong two and a half seconds because the signal's got to go from his station up to the moon and then back down to us and then we start responding it and what is amazing to me is that recording is so clear that the voice, the person on there is recognizable by his voice. And that's Doug, K6JEY. Uh, it's, if you knew, if you know Doug, you recognize his voice immediately and just go, wow, uh, on single sideband off the moon. It's that clear. So it was pretty, uh, pretty incredible to be able to do that. So we, we continued on through the contest, the, the two days of the contest. Our results were pretty astounding. We had a total of 94 QSOs. 78 of those were valid. And the reason is, is you only get to you, you only get to count one con one call sign. So it, 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 it's it, it's irrelevant what the mode is. Regardless of the mode, it's just one QSO. So out of the 94 QSOs, we had 78 valid QSOs because of the dupes, the dupes between CW and sideband. So you see, we made quite a few contacts on sideband, which was exciting. 40 multipliers. So those multipliers, those are DX entities, right? Countries and, uh, and what have you, 40 multipliers. Our claimed score was 316,000 points 
on single band. And we were, we, we submitted as a single band multi-op station. And we took first place in that year's contest for single band multi-op. And not only did we take first place, we absolutely destroyed the previous record that was set some years before on 10 on 1296, which was something like around 25,000 points. So, you know, this nowadays with the digital modes, this is easy to do this kind of a, this kind of a, uh, a score, but boy, back then, 316,000 points on CW, basically just on CW, if you want to look at it that way. It's like, wow, <laughs> that was pretty cool. Now, what's interesting is according to the ARRL, if you're using any kind of institutional system, which we are, and we we submitted the, the scores and said we were using the uh, tele, the 40 meter dish at uh, Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Well, guess what? They sent us a certificate anyway. So we got the certificate. I think it's because of the, the score that we set, the record that we set with that. They sent us a certificate. So it was uh, that was pretty cool. But some of the other astounding stuff over the over the next two and a half years, uh, we operated the system up there. We could go up, and, and the thing that was neat is we had basically it was available to us anytime any one of us wanted to go up there and operate. We had access to the pedestal to the control room. We had our own key. We could go to the control room and fire up our system, and you know, we were we were authorized to uh, use the dish. And basically, we knew how to power everything up, how to control, how to run the uh, antenna control system. And uh, it was that was really cool. So we got to go up there and we made a lot of contacts. But I want to share some of the QSL cards because some of the things that are astounding are things like this guy right here. Look at this 599 report, signal report, 599, 579. Uh, generally, I, I will tell you from my experience when you're doing EME on, on CW, you're dealing with signals that are down at the noise level. So getting a 599 signal report is pretty astounding. Uh, that, was, that was just amazing stuff. Uh, so some of the other stations we, uh, we worked, um, HB9Q is a really well-known uh, EME station. Uh, these guys have a beautiful station over in Switzerland. And I, I wish I had had a chance to visit that when I was working over there. I, I would have really loved to have gone and uh, seen their uh, setup, but it was, I wasn't in the area where they're located. So I didn't really get a chance to go see them, but uh, wow, what an amazing, what an amazing site. But we worked, uh, I, I forgot the numbers now we, for two and a half years, we'd go up and work on the weekends. You know, if the conditions were good, we'd head up there and, and uh, fire up the system and, and make contacts. Well, one of the things we wanted to do was get on 10 gigahertz. And I mentioned that so here's an interesting thing about 10 gigahertz. <laughs> that was Doug in the background, that same guy. But what's astounding to me, it, it, you do EME on 10 gigahertz, and the return signal sounds like noise. I mean, it sounds like, a, like just rushing air. You don't get any kind of tonality to it whatsoever. Well, we actually got some spreading, but there's actually some tone component to that. So you can make out that there's a pretty decent signal there. It's a big echo on 10 gigahertz. Well, it ought to be. Our footprint on the moon is about 200 miles in diameter. So the, uh, the beam width at 1286, I will tell you, is about a half a degree. So we're essentially, when we're pointed at the moon, we're illuminating the entire moon. So we're getting a lot of signal back. 10 gigahertz, we're illuminating about a 200 mile circle. So uh, one of the things that we did as an experiment was to move the antenna around and find out where it reflected the best. And we found that that was one of the experiments we conducted. Uh, we, uh, we moved the antenna around looking at different locations on the surface of the moon and found the, one of the mares and I don't, I don't remember which one it is. It's the one at the center of the moon, which makes sense. It's a big flat, you know, reasonably flat, well, spherical surface at the center of the moon, what we see, but it's relatively smooth. So it's re reflecting a lot of signal back and we got good returns, but even the lousy returns we got. How about this on 10 gigahertz, 35 dB signal to noise ratio. 
35 dB. And that was one of, not one of the better ones. That was the only one that I, I, I lost a bunch of data. I had a computer crash and I lost all the recordings and everything. And the really big, insane signals that we got back from the moon I lost, unfortunately, but this was one of the first ones we did and it just massive signals coming back. So 10 gigahertz was pretty amazing, but I will share one of the things that was predicted before we did this is that we wouldn't be able to make any two way contacts unless we talked to somebody with a dish on par with what we were using. Uh, if you think about a, a small dish on 10 gigahertz, you know, let's say three meters or three or four meters it's uh, got a fairly wide beam width and uh, not a lot of that signal is returning. Now we may be able to hear them, but they aren't going to be able to hear us because they're just getting a tiny, tiny little portion of their, of their, uh, of that return signal. So it was kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's very asymmetric and we were warned of that. We, we had a lot of discussions about it ahead of time and it proved to be true. We never found anybody with a big enough dish that we could talk to that we could do a two-way on 10 gigahertz. So we, we uh, settled for doing echoes and mapping. One of the curious things that came out of this when we were mapping the surface is there was a steady stream of researchers from the observatory coming out to visit us because they got word that we were transmitting and, and actually trying to map the surface of the moon for 10 gigahertz. And they were curious about that because that hadn't been done since the 50s. The last time anybody had done a radar mapping of the moon was in the 50s. So these guys are coming back, coming by all, all night long. We're getting a stream of, uh, of science, uh, researchers, you know, basically uh, the, the uh, astronomers at the observatory coming by and visiting us. And that was a lot of fun and uh, getting, to, getting to sit and visit with them and hear about the stuff that they're doing. And they took a lot of interest in what we were doing as well, which was very cool. Well, guess what? You know, Murphy never goes away. He's always hanging around. So what happens? We get a, you know, over two and a half years, we had all kinds of things go wrong. You know, the mixer fails on 10 gigahertz transverter. Um, and so when something fails on the transverter, it starts what I call a familiar routine. We disconnect the package from the focus, bring it down, load it in a truck, take it over to the lab at OVRO. We repair it and then bring it back and put it back up there. And then you repeat <laughs> and you do this every time something fails. And some of the failures were pretty substantial. We, uh, that 30 watt TWTA, the TWT amplifier on uh, 10 gigahertz. Uh, one of the things about that, that runs at a fairly high voltage. And we got up, we were up there one morning starting up and we fired things up. We, what we needed to do is to fire up the transverters and let things warm up for a while because there was some humidity and there was some condensation inside the receiver package and in particular in the power supply on the TWT. And we blew up that 30 watt TWT. So that was kind of a drag. But you know what? We had it, it was being driven by a one watt PA and I'll tell you one watt was 70, uh, whatever it is, 71 dB a gain. That's a pretty substantial signal still. So anyway, so we had to repeat this a few times and here's, here's the ordeal. We get Mark climbing up to the focus. That's Mark Hodges, Dr. Hodges. He disc, you know, he unbolts the thing, hooks it. Well, he hooks it up to the hoist, unbolts it. We lower it down to the ground. And there it is coming down. And there's yours truly standing down there waiting for it. We get it. We disconnect it. We load it in the truck. And guess what? We even do this in the middle of the night. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If the thing fails, we got to fix it. So we're out there in the middle of the night moving stuff around. So we get, take it back to the lab. And again, here's yours truly, soldering iron in hand, fixing something. It looks like, uh, I was thinking that we were, we were replacing a mixer, but it looks like I'm re replacing the LNA. We might have blown the LNA out of this thing somehow. <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> but as you'd expect, as you would expect, as is normal, we got one guy doing the work and three supervisors, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, but it was all fun. So we continued our operations on EME. Like I mentioned, we, uh, we went for two and a half years. But after two and a half years, we lost access to the dish. And this was because uh, somebody doing some research obtained some grant money. And then he obtained some additional grant money. And as far as we are concerned, this is great for OVRO because people were being laid off. 
There wasn't there wasn't money to to for for salaries. James Fredsty, I mentioned the the guy that got us started on this. He uh, he was laid off because of that. But the fact that they've got money coming in and somebody using the the antenna, it's good for OVRO because they keep their their astronomers and engineers employed. Uh, of course, that's bad for us. We're hopeful that someday we'll get to go back and do this again. We don't know. We 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 maintain our relationship, and this is the important part is that we maintain the relationship with the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And through Doug, um, we have a continuing outreach program with the observatory. And uh, I noticed at least one person on here tonight, uh, uh, Loretta has been up, I think she went up to one of the outreaches up there uh, last year, uh, went up with Doug uh, uh, and uh, a group to uh, visit the observatory and, and check that out. But we do this several times a year, once in the summer and once in the winter. And it's Doug uh, combined with the Orange County Astronomers. They go up to OVRO and they're hosted by Dr. Hodges, Mark Hodges. He's their ho our host up there. And we conduct star parties because the skies are really dark up there. There's not much around in the way of light. And OVRO holds an open house. We get tours and uh, get to understand, you know, basically get explanations of how their stuff works, how radio astronomy works get to tour the facility. It's, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, and we continue with the educational outreach. And so we take kids up there. We've taken scout troops. We've taken students uh, from down in Southern California on field trips up to the observatory, spent the weekend up there. And they've gotten some real educations out of that. So this is a fascinating thing. And one of the pictures I have to share is uh, this is one of the cool things. And this gives you an idea of the scale of that antenna. When the antenna is stowed, it's pointed straight up in the air. When it's pointed straight up in the air, there's actually an access hatch and you can go on the surface of the dish. That is one big dish. So in addition, we think we've, we've inspired others to do the same thing. Uh, you know, um, there's a group in Japan uh, that runs, they, they have an old, uh, an old SATCOM dish. It's a 32 meter dish and they've, they've uh, use this on EME, and they continue to do that, which is pretty cool. Uh, they have a station there. Uh, so I think they took inspiration from us doing this to, to go out and seek out that antenna. But the other one, which is interesting, is here in California in Jamesburg, which is up near uh, Carmel Valley up north. Uh, this is an old ComSat Earth station. And some of you may recall, you may have run across this. This thing was being sold on eBay, sorry. It was being sold on eBay and there weren't any takers. Well, the guys up in, up in the Bay Area uh, with a 50 megahertz and up group approached the owner and said, hey, can we use this antenna for a while until you sell it? And uh, they said, okay, they, he allowed them to use it. So they, they actually did what we did. They had this, uh, this antenna up and running. It's a, it's a 30 meter, yeah, it's 30 meter dish. It's a 90 foot dish. And they were doing some EME with it and uh, had a lot of fun, but they couldn't continue with it. They only got to do it for a short period of time. And as far as I know, the thing's probably still for sale. Uh, <laughs> uh, pretty funny stuff, but anyway. Uh, but I will tell you, we weren't the first to use institutional antennas. And, and you know, the first was of course, our friends down in uh, Puerto Rico at, uh, uh, at uh, Arecibo. Uh, the first uh, amateur contacts on 432 were done from Arecibo uh, back in 1964. So it's, and, and it's, this has been done many times over the years since then. Of course, now the antenna's gone. It, it was destroyed by the earthquake down there. So um, no chance of doing that anymore, but uh, there've been a lot of activations of Arecibo over the years on amateur frequencies. So that's cool, that's cool. But uh, I, I like to think about that, that we're following in the footsteps of giants in doing that, because those are pr some pretty incredible people made that happen. Well, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, wow. Almost to the focus. I'm still climbing. We're almost to the end. <laughs> so here's our core team. Uh, th this is our core team doing our, uh, our hero shot in front of the antenna. There's Dr. Doug, K6JUI, Dr. Hodges, uh, Chuck Swedbloom, who is unfortunately a silent key, 
and myself, uh, yours truly, Dennis, Dennis uh, Kidder, W6DQ, mugging for the uh, camera. So one of the things I want to do is I want to acknowledge the people that helped us out. Of course, uh, Dr. Hodges and Jim Fredstein were very important in getting us started. Tony, Be Tony Beasley, Dr. Beasley, um, he gave us the green light. So we're forever indebted to him. And guess what? He is now the director of the National Radio Astronomical Observatory, NRAO. That is, the, that is funded by the national, that is at, at the highest levels of government. That is what he is running. So that is really cool that he was the guy that gave us the green light and he's gone on to huge places. So we really dig that. Uh, SBMS and friends, of course, Chuck uh, mentioned, uh, he, he did a lot of the design and fabrication of the, of the microwave, the, the RF portion of it. I myself did all the uh, IF, IF equipment, the uh, setting up all the IF systems and all of that. Uh, we had guys from uh, other guys from, uh, uh, from SBMS. I mentioned Bill, he did the cable plant docks, John Oppen, Jeff Fort came up and operated on the weekends and helped us out. Uh, Greg Stallman, KJ6KO, he provided that 100 watt PA for us. Jerry Mulchin and 7EME provided the LO for 1.2 gigs and Mel Swanberg, another SBMSer, provided the LO for 10 gigahertz. And Rich Witted and Ray Grace did all the photography that we used. So I always wanna thank those guys and give, acknowledge them. But I also have a postscript to this presentation. Do you recall the title? EME on 40 meters. And you think that's absurd, right? Right? Well, in 2008, somebody did it. EME on seven megahertz. There you go, Dan. <laughs> I told you it would be at the end of the presentation. I, the, the secret would be revealed. And of course, a lot of you probably know about this harp up in Alaska, the high frequency active auroral research project did an experiment where they were transmitting a, just, just below the ham band and just above the ham band with 15 megawatts of output power. And me sitting down in Fullerton, down in Orange County, California, using an FT-1000 Mark V at a dipole, received the signals. And these signals were, were the, the sky wave and the, the uh, uh, echoes were roughly the same strength <laughs> on the 40 meters. And they were typically S9 and above. It was, they were bodacious signals. There were times where the echoes were louder than the, uh, than the uh, incident signal. So the sky wave, as it was amazing. That was pretty cool. Uh, and this was a, a spectrograph I did and you can plainly see the Doppler shift, even at seven megahertz, there's plenty of Doppler shift. And it's around, I think, what, 30, something like around, uh, no, it's not that much. It's, it's, what am I looking at? It's around six hertz, I think, is the Doppler shift. But the, but but I was able to uh, to plot that out, and you can see the the uh, incident and reflected signals there, and they're roughly the same amplitude, which is pretty amazing. Okay, last but not least, I'm going to share. This is the QSL card that we made up, W6 IFE for San Bernardino Microwave Society, and uh, we sent out quite a few of those guys, and I love that photograph. Uh, that's a that's a beautiful card. And of course, in, in, in final, my final words, I want to uh, make a dedication of this presentation to my mentor and dear friend, Chuck Swedbloom, who passed away in 2020. And uh, this is dedicated to him. He would drive by OVRO. He lived here in Ridgecrest, where we live here, this in the valley. He would drive up to uh, Bishop regularly, driving past that observatory, and he would dream of using that dish. He contacted them and found out what it would take to do that. And it's, uh, you basically have to pay somebody's salary and access to the dish to do it. So it's kind of out of the reach of your typical amateur to do that. So he dreamed about it, but he finally got a chance to do it. And, and that just, it made me feel so good that he was able to do that, that all of us just really felt so happy that, that Chuck got a chance to, uh, to actually use that big 40 meter dish up there that he had dreamed of using for so many years. But uh, he was quite a mentor to many of us in the microwave, uh, the microwave society. So he is dearly missed, dearly missed. Anyway, that is, uh, 
it for the, my presentation. Uh, what follows is uh, the usual Q&A. And with that, I will drop the share screen. And uh, let's go back here and see if we've got some, some questions. What have we got? Mary, what we got in chat? Uh, from Elizabeth, uh, how big was the smallest dish that received a clear transmission on voice and CW? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, a typical dish on 1296 uh, is like three meters. You, it's, I, I've got a, a three meter dish out back here that I'm working on right now. And that you can very successfully use that on 1296 to do, uh, to do CW. Uh, with good with a, with with good receiver, good low noise receiver, and the station at the other end with power. So I would say that it, probably smaller dishes than that would probably be able to hear it. I actually, to to tell you the truth, um, uh, there was one weekend I couldn't go up there, but I was back home in Long Beach at the time, and I sat out back with an I, a Yesu seven thirty six R that had a twelve ninety six module in it with a long Yagi on 1296 and I could hear them, their, their transmissions. I could hear them transmitting. I couldn't hear anybody else, but I could hear them. So that kind of gives you an idea. That was about a, oh, how big a Yagi? It's not a giant Yagi. It's probably about 15 elements, something like that. So it's not a great deal of gain, but it really didn't take a lot. you know. So that I hope that answers the question a little bit. It wouldn't take much to hear those reflections. So that's a, you know, a bodacious amount of gain <laughs> with a lot of power. So yeah, there's okay, the, this, go ahead. What spectrum analyzer would you recommend? And is Spectrum Lab one kind of software? Yeah, well, Spectrum Lab, is an, it's a great piece of software. It's free. Uh, it's from, a, I can't think of the fellow's call sign. It's if you, if you Google Spectrum Lab, it's an audio spectrum analyzer that uses the sound card in your computer. And so I was using that to look at the return signals, right? Now, for a spectrum analyzer, I, you know, I've got several spectrum analyzers that I have here for my station in my lab here. So there's a lot of good spectrum analyzers, spectrum analyzers out there. Uh, what's great is if you want to get a spectrum analyzer today, you can get one of the uh, the tiny SAs. You can get those on Amazon and eBay for $150 that you can hold in your hand. It's not a high performance spectrum analyzer, but it certainly does the job for the kinds of things that we typically do. Uh, but I think one of the one of the great sources is to find an old HP spectrum analyzer, like an 8566. These things are bodacious, huge boat anchors. The thing weighs about 100 pounds. Uh, but 8566 is a great lab instrument. They can be had fairly inexpensively these days. But there's a lot of other ones that are out there that you can get that are small and portable and high performance. And that's really the key. That's the difference between the tiny SA and something like my my Tektronix 494, that, or yeah, 494 that I've got in my lab and the 8566, those are high performance analyzers. The tiny SA, it'll go up to a fairly high frequency, but it's it doesn't have a real decent D to A in it. So the dynamic range is not that great. So uh, it can give you an idea, you know, what's going on. And of course, SDRs, uh, SDR is, is, is typically a spectrum analyzer. If you think about it, that's what it, that's what it is. Um, or a spectrum analyzer can be an SDR. Um, I use my SDRs. I've got a, a 6700 behind me here on the next table uh, that I use for doing uh, analysis, spectrum analysis. It's very handy for that. It's quick and easy and, and accurate. So that's, uh, I don't know what else to add to that. Let's see. No yeah. other questions Let's and see. no other hands. Well, thank you for Back the Back to you, Dan. All right. Well, what can I say? This was another great presentation. Right. You could not be there no more. Twisted. Well, I agree. You could so far uh, out. Could I ask one more question? Far away. Absolutely. Um, I have that Radio Jove kit that I got from that website. Yes. Um, I'm having trouble with the software, but... Uh, the antenna, even though it's only 10 feet up, uh, picks up a lot of stuff. What does your spectrum analyzer, your, your, um, uh, I think you said you have the te Tektron 
Oh, it's a Tektronix by 484. Tek yeah. Do, can it pick up Jupiter? Uh, I've never tried that with that. I, I would be inclined not to do that. I'd use something like the uh, the SDR here behind me to do that. That that analyzer is really useful for the stuff that I do in microwave, where we're you know basically testing and fabricating microwave hardware. Uh, that thing is good up to with mixers. I can get up to 300 gigahertz with that analyzer. So uh, that's what it's used for. Primarily 10 gigs and up is what I use that for. The 8566 is good to like uh, what two gigahertz something like that and it goes down into hf and i've got several hp analyzers that i use for that but i wouldn't use those as a receiver uh, i would i would use a use a you really want a receiver with a low noise amplifier or some kind of an rf stage in front of it um, to get down to the, the low noise levels so that's why i think like i haven't tried it that's something i you know loretta that's something i should try is is the uh radio sky pipe software on the uh, computer behind me running flex that would be an interesting thing to try out that should work actually well it's been a really really great presentation and uh, at this point i probably should shut her down and say 73s and hopefully see most of you tomorrow thanks dan thanks barry seven threes to everybody seven three everybody seven three See y'all later.